Welcome back to another episode of The Magician's Call. I'm Dr. Lahab Al Samurai, and this is Lance Allred. And uh, Lance, you want to say hello to everybody? Hello, gang. Glad to have you back joining us. And uh, I'm excited for this conversation today, Lahab. Yeah, me too, Lance. We said today we talk about alchemy. Mm -hmm. um, the alchemical process. So every magician must practice alchemy. Yes. Um, I've been sitting with that, really contemplating. And, you know, contemplation is, uh, let's clarify what it means to contemplate. I would say there's meditation and then there is um, action. But I think contemplation is meditation in movement. Ooh. Meaning that as you move about the day, you're still always in a state of meditation, allowing the energy of the word or the idea to percolate and move mm -hmm. about with you through your daily actions. So that's what I think it means to contemplate. Mm. So I was going to read something. Yes. From this book. It's uh, Mary Louise von Franz's book. It's, uh, she did a lot of translating of the alchemical act of imagination, it's called, but she did a lot of, um, she did a lot of interpretation of these old Latin texts of the alchemists. So she interpreted a lot of their stories. So this is one, this is a, this is a spell, this is a magic spell. Um, and it goes... Now irrigate your body with the water of life, with the word of God. Day and night, meditate about it. So the body has no time to talk or think of anything else. The good earth is a soft heart, which is ashamed and humble. Since the fall of Adam, the hearts of men have become hard as stones. And if they are not softened again by the word of God, they will remain stones forever. And so we will all become enemies of God till this enmity is again overcome through the highest gardener and his servant, the men's. Therefore, let us thank God who thought us worth to enlighten our hearts with his light, soft, soften, soften it and his words. Go now and try to find virtue. So they used to say this to bind themselves to the earth in an active alchemical way so you, you're mm -hmm. saying this kind of prayer but what you're really doing is you're binding yourself to the planet right as a creation that you've been yes. created and because this is uh the road of creation so the alchemical process here is to bind yourself to the plane that you exist on exactly by doing that is what you're going to talk about is to free up your ability to not be held in these planes. Um, to free you up at the same time. It absolutely. does both tasks. I think there's, that's a profound text you just read because a lot of people universally label me as new age and mm. I do not consider myself new age. Mm. What I mean by that is a lot of new age text or a lot of new age notion is, oh, um, love and light, let's be up in the clouds, let's vibrate and lead this earth and let's ascend to a higher plane. But the magician understands when they move into clarity that we're here for a reason. As above, so too below. As below, so too above. Correct. And there is necessity for vibrating in this dimension to set off the chain reaction through different fractal timelines. And so my whole philosophy or spiritual modality really is down and in, Ooh. meaning vibrate, bring everything that you want to manifest or alchemize down from the stars, from the clouds, and understand that we are guests here on this planet. Ooh. 
that when people say, oh, I can't wait to get to the other dimensions or whatever, you're basically saying, you're insulting a host by saying, oh, I don't like staying here. Your house is garbage. Get me out of here. It's bad manners. Ooh. So show some respect for your host, which is Mother Earth, and say, I am here for a reason in this place and time. Ooh. And that is to, again, alchemize and set off chain reactions at a vibrational frequency that will carry through not just this dimension, this game board, but through others beyond that understanding that every link in the chain is crucial. Ooh. And so therefore, a lot of people, when they're trying to meditate, they're trying to go somewhere else. Ooh. When I meditate, I try to ground and get wisdom from within. Ooh. understanding that my heart is the stargate to the cosmos not some other ethereal plane correct so this is the way in is the way through so yes. you go through you to get in yes but you have to go through you yes you can't project you to... mm -hmm. is what you're saying you can't right. project you out there you no. have to go through you to be able mm -hmm. to get to where you're going and a key point to this, a lot of people, when they're trying to meditate and go somewhere else, they're trying to escape. Ooh. But in order to go through you, you have to face all of your bullshit stories Ooh. and your trauma um, and be brave enough to confront them, not escape them. And those stories are really what is the toll that is required to alchemize. Ooh. So when we talk about alchemy, what keeps reverberating back to me is something for something. That we as magicians understand there's a balance. We're here to hold the balance. Yeah. That I can't just wish and hope for all of my dreams to come true and the secret says the universe is gonna give it to me scot-free. No something for something and usually what that is is an old identity or an old story that i'm holding on to a piece of me that i still want to exist but as the magician knows with the many deaths that you have each death then is fuel to the phoenix fire as you reincarnate into new iteration of you Ooh. leaving or burning away old stories and that Ooh. is the toll that is paid and so that is the currency that you are dealing with as you attempt to go inward so creation can come through you Ooh. so she 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 gives an interpretation i wanted to read it to you i thought you might enjoy mm -hmm. it. um she's a, she says uh, this stage in alchemy that alludes to a so-called second death then to a multiplicitio and also to a projectico. Again, please do not associate Jungian terminology with that in general. It is the <laughs> stage where the philosopher's stone, yes, after it has been made in the retort, has to be destroyed again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Several times and then remade. A kind of complete... Repetition of the work, which generally is done four times for the four elements. This is repeated destruction of the Philosopher's Stone and its remaking was called the Ratio, a rotation through the four elements. After the <laughs> retort is usually broken or open, then begins the stage of the Multiplicio through projection. The ideas of the Philosopher's Stone, which is also a form of mystical gold yes. that the alchemists were trying to make is made, is then thrown upon other unclean matter, that is, other matter which has not been included in the process, like ordinary iron, ordinary lead, or any other material. It shows mm -hmm. then a transformative quality for it transforms these other materials through the projection, it transforms them into gold and has what one could call a positive, contagious effect on the other materials. Yes. What I see 
when I think of the Philosopher's Stone, a lot of people, they take the words gold and Philosopher's Stones literally, that they're supposed to be some substantial, tangible thing they're holding. But you and I know gold is a universal metaphor for anything that is beyond material value. Ooh. And that's wisdom. That's clarity. That's gold. You can't put a price tag on clarity. Um, wisdom cannot be quantified. Yes. Can't. And so taking lead um, and other unclean materials, really, I see it metaphorically for the trauma and the um, short-sighted view of the material world, trying to hold on to things that inevitably fade away. Yes. And to then alchemize those things that cannot go with you to the other incarnations. Alchemize it into wisdom and experience, which, which does translate with you mm. to other dimensions. Yes. Well, to do, so to do the first part is to be able to project yourself in the second part. Yes. So it's a two-part process. One is to deny your ascent so you can ascend. Yeah. You not ascend if you do not deny your ascent. You have to pull back from your ascent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it has to be done in the same way over and over again. It has to be done with an intention yes with no deception um with an intention and as you go through and you complete the cycle you're in the clarity knowing that there will be many other cycles of purification of alchemical right. purification right. but when you're at the beginning of the next cycle or in the middle of it you hate it this is not to say that you and I, Lahab, I'm, I'm currently coming out of a cycle of grief. Ooh. It's not to say I've been like, oh, this is fun. Ooh. This is great. Ooh. But understanding is some part of me, I cannot run away from it. And so as I was stuck in grief, instead of me trying to distract myself, there was discipline inevitably after many other iterations of just, you know what, this is a process and I trust this process and I sit with it understanding that as I gain the skill of alchemical process, and it is a skill, each one gets shorter and shorter and shorter. But understanding that it's just the way the universe works Ooh. naturally. Stars die, black holes form, and then other life is created from that void, other, other galaxies. That's just the way it works, something for something. Understanding if I'm brave enough, to say my grief and my loss and my death of who I am with my father dying, for example, no one else is going to see Lance the way my father saw Lance. Mm. That version of Lance died with my father. Mm. That iteration of Lance is now gone. Mm. But understanding something for something, as I let that go, something else will be reborn in that place. And a lot of people are afraid of that price, of that cost. But Lahab, as you know, as you willingly step into the alchemical process and let yourself die and be reborn, as you move into clarity and you're more light, you're more fluid, you're more able to maneuver through the chessboard of this dimension, you look back and you see that really, after all is said and done, it wasn't that heavy of a cost anyway, mm. because that old iteration of me was so weighed down by stories that no longer serve me. Well, you're freed up of the projection. You no longer carry that projection. That projection is gone. Yeah. That projection goes with that person. And mm. your need to hold on to that projection is also gone. Yes. It also dies. And that's what you grieve. You Absolutely. Grieve you grieve that projection that you wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You that wanted to turn into gold. You wanted, wanted that to, to be the gold. That 
there's some part of me that thinks I can be who I am right now and have all of my dreams come true and nothing about me has to change. Ooh. That's a child archetype story. Ooh. Saying, I want all my dreams to come true and I don't have to do anything to get it just because I deserve it. Um, that's, again, I- The love... fantasy is that you know what the dreams are. Yeah. The fantasy is always that I know where I'm going and what I'm doing at all time. That's the fantasy <laughs> because you, you know, once you get there, you're like, what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah. I, you, you hit a, a beautiful point right on the head that I am someone that has written down my goals all throughout my life and I mm. read them aloud. Mm. But I can tell anyone, every goal I have written down has come true in mm. some way, shape or form. Mm. Did it ever look like what I thought it was going yeah. to look like? Mm. Never. Never. Yeah. It has never looked like the thought I was projecting or fantasizing it to be. And again, that's part of the story that the expectation that you're holding on to, the understanding, I don't get to decide all of the variables and how everything looks, but I can if I'm brave enough and willing to pay the toll and step into grit and heartbreak and disappointment and pay the refiner's fire with alchemical fuel. Mm. I can manifest incredible things in this world, but I do not get to hold on to them. They're not mine. They're no, the they're the universes. We talked about last week. You made a point of it. It's from the universe. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not ours. Yes. We get it. Ours. We get a glimpse of it. We get a glimpse. We get very excited. We start jumping up and down. Look, look what I saw. Look what I saw. Look what I saw. Because yeah. that's what the universe has shown us. Yes. Yes. We saw, we saw a flash. We saw a snapshot. And then our brain filled in the rest of the gaps. Yes. Thinking I get to decide all these other variables. And no, we do not. No. Not at all. No, we are the pieces on the chessboard and we are not making our own moves. <laughs> no, no, no. That, you know, for example, like just because I saw visions of black and white of me playing in an NBA jersey on an NBA game, Ooh. my human brain then decided, oh, well, it's going to be this amount of years for this long. Ooh. And no, I don't get to decide that. No. And being able to let that version of Lance die, that a lot of people still want to come and address the athlete archetype within me. And I don't take it personally anymore when they fail to see the other archetypes that I have or even fail to recognize the athlete will always be a part of me, but it's no longer my main identity. It's no longer my main driving archetype. Mm -hmm that is a past version of me that people are still trying to tap to and speak to. But instead of being annoyed with the understanding, okay, these are the many archetypal weapons that I have at my disposal that I surrender to the universe to let the universe play with them how it wishes to create and manifest in this dimension what it wants to see. Ooh. So I see that you had an image of yourself playing in black and white, playing in an NBA jersey. So yeah. you, saw, you saw yourself where you were supposed to be. But this is where we go back to the earlier point that you were talking about, the dreams that somehow when we get there, they don't look exactly the way we plan them out. Nope. Something else happens and different alchemical process occurs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Different alchemical processes occur and we all have to be brave enough as magicians um, to face the truth that most of us will never truly see the fruits of our labor. That is usually after we pass on. Yeah. That people see the genius yeah and we have to be brave enough to accept that and that aligns us with the void or death consciousness whatever you yeah. want and we can be afraid of aligning 
with that expression, death consciousness, but that void is the origin. The darkness within the woman is dark, but that's the womb. That is where life comes from. It's pitch black in there and we're terrified of it. Ooh. But that is where life is created and that is where we return when we die. Yes, to emerge the, again. Say what? The, there is a reemergence. This is a process. You have to keep going through this process. Whatever the reason is, we have to keep doing this over and over again. We do. And the thing is, we have many deaths. Yes. Like many, many deaths. Yes. M-I-N-I, many yes. deaths in this incarnation. Absolutely. Your athlete, your athlete had to die. The athlete has to die. The child your has to die. Um, another story that is dying is, uh, I was speaking with my mother about it last night, is a family pattern from polygamy that my worth as a man is attached to the quantity of women that I married. Ooh. That was from my grandfather going down to my father, who was my worth as a monogamous man is now attached to the quality of the woman that I married. And he Ooh. doted on my mother. And now here I am as a single man facing even less than that. Ooh. Am I able to find my worth and value in my own solitude Ooh. as my own sovereign Ooh. and think of all the many deaths that i've had to go through and the Ooh. stories of how i was measuring my worth and those metrics that define me as a man Ooh. and so those are just many many but then each incarnation that's a death and rebirth of a past life but you think of all the many iterations that died within each lifespan. So there is this fractal game of many deaths within a major death, within many other major deaths. And so you just see it when you take a step back and you see as scary and unpleasant as it is when you look at it myopically, when you take a step back, the magician sees the holographic circle, the Ooh. sphere of how all these nuclei of incarnations keep dying and being reborn like the star uh splits into two uh like an atom does when it starts to create life there is that that's just the way the universe functions it's not to say it's fun it doesn't feel comfortable yes but that resistance as you know when a baby is born uh through c-section rather than through the womb uh, it loses out on a lot of resistance training, a lot of resistance stamina. Ooh. And that resistance is needed. So people who are always saying, oh, I float down the river path uh, through the path of least resistance, that is counterintuitive to the mantra of the athlete, which says, mm -hmm. I have to put myself through extreme duress, through extreme resistance in the off season for training and stamina buildup so that when it comes time to play the game, I have the fortitude and the endurance to outlast everyone else. Ooh. So the magician really steps into the necessity of resistance and discomfort Ooh. when a lot of people are trying to bypass it. Ooh. Yeah, I agree. And I think this is what uh, helps the uh, alchemical process along. It's, uh, yes. you have to be able to face the many deaths. You have to see their purpose. You have to see why uh, they had to end. And you mm -hmm. have to be a witness to the ending. So you can yes. actually be a witness to a new beginning. Because mm -hmm. as one thing falls, another thing is propped up. Yes. Um, and the magician, again, holding the balance, the magician being heart centered, masculine and feminine, the magician is left brain and right brain. One of my great heroes is Albert Einstein. Ooh. My favorite quote of his is science without religion is dangerous. Ooh. And it goes both ways Ooh. that we can be spiritual and want to be again all ephemeral, but we also have to understand in this dimension. In this 3D dimension, there are physical laws Ooh. of physics, thermodynamics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. 
So if people who are trying to say, oh, well, I can bend space and time and I can do all the things, let me ask you, just use a sports metaphor. If you and I were watching a basketball game and there's 10 guys on the court, but one player, Steph Curry, could dribble out of bounds without penalty because he bended the rules of space and time, would that be inspiring to watch? Mm. No, because mm. he's not mastering the rules of the game. Mm. The magician says, I see the rules of the game mm. and I will manipulate and play with them and master my craft. But there are a fine subset set of rules of, of rules that we have to abide by in this dimension because in this dimension again we are vibrating at a necessary frequency to set our chain reaction in other dimensions yeah. so therefore the magician going back to the point we understand the necessity of heaven and earth of above and below head and heart mm. being able to hold all of them at the same time heart centered not just masculine not just feminine not just left brain not just right brain mm. but all of it and so we see a polarized world of the left brain atheist versus the right brained religious or new age person who's all anti-vaccine is all a conspiracy and the magician says um yes there is abuse of things but there's also a necessity for a healthy balance to understand that science is what is going to drive technological innovation for us to actually have the material and the uh, resources to do intergalactic travel. Ooh. We can't throw it all out with the bathwater. It's being able to hold a healthy balance of both understanding, okay, here are the rules of the game and am I crafty enough to master all of them, all of these rules and not try to cheat or shortcut it? I love it. I love it. I want to get back to Stephen Curry though, because you brought, you, you brought Stephen Curry up. So I want to, he doesn't need to dribble out of bounds. He flows within the archetype. I've seen oh, yeah. him play. He's a magician. <laughs> He's a magician. He, he is an amazing magician. And he does amazing things with that ball that you don't think that anybody should be able to do. Um, no. Yeah. But he does it within the rules of the game. Well, that's yeah, well, that's that's what makes you great, right? You can right. Uh, you can play within the confines of what they're trying to confine you to. Exactly. Yeah. But the, so the thing that makes you greater is to be able to walk out of those confines once they no longer fit you. Right. But being able to understand, okay, I am crafty enough and resourceful enough that I am not forever damned to this confine, but I am resourceful enough. If you want me to step into this little game and play for a little bit, I will. And watch me do something magical. And then being able to say, okay, the rules, uh, I'm done. That Steph Curry definitely irritated a lot of people. And a lot of people don't like him because he changed the dynamic of the game of basketball mm -hmm. so drastically mm -hmm. that everyone was so set on, this is the culture of basketball. This is the right way to play the game. Mm -hmm. The magician doesn't necessarily change the rules he does change the lens on how you can play the rules of the game. Mm. And that is what drives a lot of the, again, chancellor archetypes, mm. the politicians who play by the rules and then try to manipulate them and hold on to their power. Mm. They master, quote, that systemic view of the rules of the confines that the magician comes in and completely turns them upside down. Mm. while still, again, honoring and acknowledging these are the rules of the game. Okay, you said these are the rules? All right. I'm going to tweak with these rules, and I'm going to stretch them to the very limit mm. beyond what you thought was possible that it completely changes the complete culture mm. of the game. And that is a beautiful example of the magician archetype of work, and that is Steph Curry. He's a perfect example mm. of a magician altering uh, the culture and the way a game is played. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So you have you have magicians on the basketball court 
you have them at sea, you have them on land, you have them in the ice ring, you have them everywhere. Um, everywhere. But and where's the alchemical the toll? And what's the alchemical toll? Yeah. Blood, sweat, tears, lactic acid fermentation. When your muscle is building and burning and you're yeah. ripping out old muscle fibers and building new fibers, yeah. that is an alchemical reaction. Yes. yes. And that is one vibration. You can do it at the physical level. You can do it at the brain level, the emotional, the mental, the physiological, the metaphysical level. There's so many levels that alchemical processes occur. Correct. And the magician does not limit himself to just one um, paradigm yeah. where alchemical fires burn. No. No, that's why you keep practicing the alchemical. That's why you keep rewriting the alchemical text. Yes. Because there is not one way to do something. No, there's there not. That's, several ways that, to do something. And that's, that's the fun of it. That's the beauty of it. And I think something that you have coached me on, that you're recently working with me on, is that sometimes we can get so lost in the discomfort and discouraged in the gritty part of the alchemical fire that so much of the magician's piston strength mm. comes from their ability to remind themselves this is a game. Mm. We're having fun. Mm. We can make it fun. Yeah. And be able to step back and say in a beautiful way, mm not in a flippant or a disrespectful way, but in a beautiful way, honoring everything because everything is sacred or nothing is sacred. Correct. The magician can say, and none of this really matters. It doesn't really. <laughs> At the same time, it is that the, it's the most important thing in the world. <laughs> it's not. It's not. And that gives you so much universal power because when you're able to say none of this really matters your identity is alchemized because you're no longer holding your identity to some metric value because when you're saying something really matters again you're putting credence to it you're putting value to it and you're attaching yourself to that value trying but to you get have to understand this. your attachment to break away from it you have exactly. to become conscious of why this is the most important thing in the world. It's the only way to break away from it. Absolutely. If you don't understand it, there is no transcendence. There is no, you don't learn the universal law. Yes. And so when you're able to say, and none of this really matters, you then surrender yourself and your identity and that dies. You are throwing your identity into the fire. Correct. And saying it's no longer about me and my universal worth as an extension of the universe cannot be quantified by such childish things. Yeah, this is the alchemical way. You burn yes. the old dress so you could don a new dress. Yes, knowing eventually that new dress will need to be burned too. Yes, absolutely. As soon as you put it on, it's time is almost up. <laughs> His time is almost up immediately as you put it on. <laughs> That's very true. And it's funny because it's true. And so I know this is hard when you're in the middle of it and you're lost in the forest and you are engulfed by the pain body of everyone else's trauma and you're in trauma that you have put so much time into that identity that we want our time to mean something. Ooh. That, oh, I've been recovering for four years from a bad relationship. Oh, you're telling me I just need to let it go and let it burn? No, I need my pound of flesh. Ooh. Or else what was all the four years of suffering for? Learning. And we hold, I would say what? It's learning. It's learning. It's learning that we and don't need to suffer for four years, but it took us four don't. years to figure it out. <laughs> yes. Sometimes it takes that long to figure shit out. It does. Oh, heaven knows I've spent more than four years on some issues. Um, but 
once you finally, again, develop the skill and the trust of the process of the alchemical fire, the alchemical process, really, at the end of the day, if someone asks me, what is one thing I can ha hang my hat on? Um, it's the grief cycle. Because I've had enough loss in my life, so many deaths of so many iterations and identities of who I thought I had to be that as much as I have resisted going through them, that I can look back and I can see the cost benefit far outweighed the toll that was required Ooh. to go through that process. And so anyone who's in the middle of it, I understand how hard it is to hear this. Oh, wait, no, I can't let it go because you're telling me no, because they need to say they're sorry. They need to be punished. Um, that's their path. That's their karma. But if you want to step into the game and actually enjoy life, you have to really step into the playfulness and be able to surrender all of it, even surrender yourself and your stories and say, and none of this matters at all. Ooh. That allows you to move with so much lightness. Um, because again, look at Steph Curry and these athletes, look at Michael Jordan, and Joe Montana, they weren't the biggest guys. Ooh. They were light footed. Ooh. They were quick. They were able to maneuver, be nimble, while you have all these Goliaths on the fields trying to out empower you. Mm. But the thing is, they, they've spent so much time building that muscle mm. that they wanted to account for something. Mm. And therefore, they're now so slow. And they're holding on to all that muscle that they spent thousands of hours in the weight room building up. No, it has mm. to mean something. Yeah. You're telling me I wasted all that time how I got to drop all this weight? Mm. No, Steph Curry, I hate Steph Curry. That's what they say because he changed the rules that a lot of people developed all these skills that people realize are outdated mm -hmm. like okay and they can resist it and become irrelevant mm -hmm. and as darwin said it's not the strongest that survive it's those who are most willing to adapt mm -hmm. that survive and that is something that the magician must align with fluidity and the threshold to continually be burnt by the fire Mm. you can align with it but you're also going to get burned and it hurts but it's necessary every single time it hurts every single time i say every single time it hurts and again it's like every time you go to the dentist chair you know it's going to hurt mm. but you know it's necessary <laughs> it's, it's never going to be fun it's never going no. to be something to look forward to. No, it's not. No, I know exactly uh, what you mean. So this is, no. uh, so the alchemical process is occurring all the time. So uh, give some simple examples of alchemical processes. Uh, Lance did a really good job, you know, talking about how these processes are occurring all the time. So just think about them there in how we grieve something and how we lose something and how we gain something and how we find something and how we search for something. All of these are a form of alchemical process in the act of imagination, in yes. the fantasy, in the world where ideas become actions. They mm -hmm. transform. So I think it is, uh, as Lance would put it, it's what uh, Stephen Curry uh, put in his mind and then transformed that on the court. Yes, yes. That we, you can find it everywhere and we see it in our seasons. And we can look at the cute little mountain flowers and say, why the hell are you trying to be reborn every spring? You know, you're going to die. What the hell are you doing? Mm. But that archetype that we're speaking of is the fool, the beautiful fool. Mm. And the universe itself is the greatest fool of all. Mm. Why is it even trying to exist? Why? What's the point? Mm. 
but that's the beautiful fool in all of us. Lance, why do you keep getting back up? Lance, you keep failing. You keep failing. You climb high, but you keep falling down. Why do you keep getting back up? Mm. Because I choose to. And that's the beautiful fool within me. Mm. I continually gets up wanting to create beauty. Mm. And that is what the magician is doing, creating beauty in this dimension, which then will echo through other dimensions. Failing is giving up and it's not getting up. Right. I don't believe that failing has to do with getting up. When you fail, <laughs> you give up. Yeah, you, give my up friend, are talking about getting up. You, my friend, are talking about moving towards the energies that be. You right. just have been pushed back on several yeah. occasions. And that pushback is required because it's, it asks you a question. The question yes. is, how, how bad do you want it? Right, right. Come and get it. How bad do you want this? Do you want this really bad? I want to see how bad you want this. Yeah. And your point is valid. That failure to me is staying inside your comfort zone, being mediocre or quitting. Yeah, giving um, up. Yeah, that's, the, that's how I really define failure. Um, and so disappointment is the more accurate word to use. That is my constant mistress. Uh, disappointment, setbacks, and I think, you're, I think yours is a much more poetic say, uh, expression. By the universe is asking, really, how badly do you really want this? And me choosing every time and saying, no, I choose this. I want this. Um, because I know once it comes through, I see the beauty it will be. Mm -hmm. Also understanding that just like a wildflower in the spring, what I create will die. Mm -hmm. Just like I will die. Mm -hmm. Only to be reborn again someday. And that's the process. Well, we're happy to have you alive with us. Yeah. We're happy to have your company. We're happy to have your wise words. We're happy to have your enthusiasm for the world and how the world moves. And we're happy to have you on podcasts so you could share this with others. Because I think it's really important. I think that we, we stop to not realize what we have and how fleeting it is and how fast it's going. Yes. This is true. This is true. And being able to step into wisdom. And someone asked me a while ago, Lance, they tried to label me as wise in my wisdom. And they asked me, like, where does it really come from? I guess I, I said to them, I guess it's just an acceptance that no matter how much we learn, we will still never fully understand or know. Well, the yes, more you learn the process, life, the more you learn how little you know. It's a contradiction, right? Yes. It's, the, it it's, the, it's like looking at something and you're getting really close to it. Yeah. You stop forgetting what you're looking at. <laughs> exactly. That's how it is. This is the universe. It plays with you. You know, you it say plays it plays a it. fool. It also plays the prankster. It plays the prankster know? that... Yeah. That, you learn this cosmic joke that the more you learn, the more you learn how little you know. Yes, yes, yes. And, and it keeps, it keeps once, throwing things in front of you to say, if you didn't think that was funny, check this out. This is really funny. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's kind of like that annoying older sibling that they're going to keep goading you until you finally start laughing. Yes. You're going to be mad and you're going to pout, but they're finally going to get that little smile out yeah. of you. It's going to make you angry, but they're going to get you to finally start laughing. Yeah. That really is. If someone wanted to ask me my whole view of the universe and how it works, that's kind of how I view it, really. It's just this um, goading you to laugh, but then you can be angry again and say, well, why the hell are we even doing this? What's the point? To create beauty. Ooh. No matter how fleeting it is. I remember when I was in college, I used to, I, I had this thing where I was really depressed. So I was like, it can't get worse than this. And it got worse. And then I yeah. said to myself, you know what? It can't get worse than this. And it got fucking worse. 
And then I said it a fourth time. I was like daring the universe, you know? And I was like, it cannot get any worse than this. And it got worse. And I was like, oh shit, I should stop saying that. That's not good. (laughs) I need to change what I'm saying. (laughs) This is not working. (laughs) Got to move out of tragedy into comedy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Know that really too. I know we've heard it before. It's either a tragedy or a comedy, but that simple expression has so much universal truth that we every day have a choice of two lenses, one or two lenses, a tragedy or a comedy. And it's okay to go to tragedy for a while and feel it. Um, Feel all of it, feel the human condition, feel the experience. And when you're ready to fully let go, you move back into comedy. And so I say it's a beautiful dance between the two. The dance needs to continue so nothing gets stale and nothing gets burnt out. Yeah, absolutely. Because you stay in tragedy too long, you start thinking that everything is tragedy. Yeah. You stay in comedy too long, you take nothing seriously after a while. Everything looks yeah. stupid. So you right. need to be, this is the alchemical process. This the is why we go back and forth. This is the, the balance. Hand. Yeah. Again, as you have so well said, the magician's job is to hold the balance. Um, that's a hard place to be. Ooh. That is that's something that needs to be said. Being in the middle, walking the path um, of the middle, which is the path of the heart in a world that is so culturally and materially rewarded for living in the extremes. Ooh. holding the path of the middle one thing that's important to be said percival who found the holy grail it wasn't king arthur it wasn't lancelot it was percival Ooh. the one who wandered out of the wilderness as a child the naive for the ways of the world his la- his name in old french literally translates into through the middle Ooh. And the way the story goes is, you know, the way you're putting it, as he walks out of the unconscious because he's crawling out of the forest. The forest is a symbol of the unconscious because when you look at the forest, you don't know what's in the forest anymore. All you see is trees covering every place. So he walks out of the unconscious and to find the Holy Grail, he has to walk in back into the unconscious to find it. He walks into a cave. Right. And he keeps walking and he's having hallucinations and he's seeing bad spirits and something is messing with his perception of what's going to happen. Yes. And then it's like it's presented. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the, al- the alchemist by Paulo Coelho really is an updated version of Percival. Ooh. That he went came out of the wilderness, traveled around the world looking for the grail and came back home to the cave. And he found it. Yeah. This is the power of myth. Yeah. Myths are important that we understand archetypes and myth at some subconscious level. And that's how the universe communicates with itself through archetypal myths. And uh, the world keeps recreating these mythological stories and people think that's an original idea, mm. but the most powerful stories are really the ones that keep uh, replenishing in different gen- generations, just updated. The and, writer, uh, the director, the producer, the filmmaker is the archetype. Of yeah. course, they're archetypal myths. They're the ones <laughs> who are pushing the agenda. They're the ones behind right. the camera, they're the behind the pen, they're behind the money, and they're behind the story. And it's like, oh, no, it has to go this way. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I want you to take a look at it, but it really, it really needs to go this way, right? Right. right. Yeah. Um, and so they're under, they understand at some subliminal level uh, the human response to these mythological patterns. And they're very good at crafting and packaging them as an original idea. Mm. Um, Sometimes skewing them and distorting them. But that is when you start having fun with the game that you see really like the game of basketball. 
there's so many rules, there's so many nuances, but really at the end of the day, it's not that complicated. Mm. That's when you step into mastery of the craft. And learning to master the game of life is when you start to recognize there's only so many mythological patterns that you realize is actually a pretty simple game. But we get lost in the complexity, wanting things to be more complex because we think that means we're smart mm. or that we're important or that we're special, which drives us further away from the source. Because we're confused. Yes. Because that's what it is. It's confusion. I've been there. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I see yeah. myself when you say it. <laughs> I've been yeah. there lost in like, oh, I need to make this more complicated. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we're confused. Yes. Um, and so that is important that the magician, really the task of the magician is to always be aiming, striving for clarity. That is his number one tool. And so people think that, oh, I got to find that crystal ball that the, that the magician or the wizard or use. Mm -hmm. The crystal ball is just a metaphor for clarity. That's the tool they're using. Clairvoyance, clarity is not necessarily the crystal ball. It's just a symbolic representation that the magician must have clarity to see the moving pieces on the board. Mm. and not get stuck in one corner of the chessboard thinking this is where the entire game is. Yeah. And so that's when we think that this one identity or this one relationship that we don't want to lose, that my significant other, this marriage, whatever, if I lose it, then I won't be anybody anymore, that you have then lost clarity of mm. the game. That you focused on losing your rook to that person's knight. Yeah. that you can't see that your queen over here is in danger mm. that's what so many of us do when we get obsessed about an iteration or an identity that the movies told us that we have to have mm. to have value in this world that i must have a significant other in my life for me to have any value in this world that's just a story that's just a product that we've been sold you know in the um Speaking of alchemy, you know, Jung used to say, um, when I first hear the dream of the dreamer, I tell myself, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> because the first thing I have to disconnect from any idea about the dream as they're telling me the dream. Mm -hmm. Because then I don't, then it becomes my projection onto the dream and I get lost in the dream. And then I don't understand the dream. Right. So I have to tell myself, Every time I have to humble myself and say, I don't know what the hell this person is talking about. Yeah. So I, can, so I can see the person objectively. He's also a magician. So I could see, so I could see clearly what the problem is. Yeah. But I can't see it if my ego takes me um, to a higher place very quickly. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, you know this, this is, you've seen this a thousand times. Instead, yeah. saying to oneself, I really don't know what the hell this is going on with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, very true. Very true. It's a form uh, of grounding. Mm -hmm. It's a form it of grounding form. for the magician because the magician needs it more than others. Because usually Absolutely. they're on track. They're on top of it. So yeah. they need to, like you said, they need the crystal ball to focus on a different object so they could see, so clarity can come about because it right. doesn't come about if they're not focused on this object. This object is actually distracting them so they could think clearly. Yes. When you fall into obsession, you're in the opposite of clarity. The magician does not become too attached to any one thing. Um, because again, that means I'm attaching my identity and my worth to one object. And that is when you have diminished your value and your ability to produce and create in this world. Um, for example, again, a sports metaphor, I can use them all day. But as a basketball player, 
Let's say my shots aren't falling that day, which happened a lot. But if I say, oh, my only worth is on how many points I'm scoring, then I'm not rebounding. I'm not getting steals. I'm not getting my teammates open to help them score. But by learning to be a cerebral basketball player with my hearing loss, able to see all these different body languages on the court happening at the same time, I was able to be very cerebral, which allowed me to stay in the game, whether I was scoring or not, because I had other tools and facets at my discretion to use as I needed, which allowed me to stay in the game. So people think they have to score points to win the game. No. Mm. You just have to stay in the game to win the game. And that's what the magician understands. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Lance, any thoughts today? Any, th any closing remarks that you want to make about alchemy? Alchemy. Be brave enough to let things die. That is, that's your greatest currency. Death is your greatest currency. And if you want to have your dreams come true, with the understanding you do not get to determine how long they live, you have to align with the universal truth of something for something. That something must die in order for something else to be born and make peace with death and let her be your constant mistress. That's what I would share. Okay, that's pretty deep, Lance. I don't think I could overcome that, so I'm gonna let it go. I, <laughs> wanna, I wanna invite our listeners for next week's all new Magician's Call. As uh, we head out into the field of alchemy and archetypes and archetypal patterns and mythology and fairy tales to explain how the magician moves, thinks, feels, and navigates the world. Um, I want to thank my co-host Lance Allred um, for his very wise and um, very moving words. With that, I'm Dr. Lahab El Samurai. This is the Magician's Call, and we will see everybody uh, next week. <laughs>